classical mistakes uh, uh, are made around the notion that build it and they will come. So entrepreneurs or management hired by entrepreneurs m might fall into the tendency of spending an inordinate, exorbitant amounts of money to quickly go to market to perhaps you know invest in infrastructure to get big offices or a huge warehouse uh, to start you know really sinking cash good cash into hard assets that don't generate sales you know some of the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make when they come for venture funding is, is really not understanding what a venture fund is all about you know the, the role of a venture fund is to make a return for its limited partners. And these limited partners are pension funds, retirement funds, school endowments. And many of the entrepreneurs actually have money indirectly in these venture funds because of those relationships. So understand if you do deal with a venture capitalist that their job is to get a return and they're going to manage uh, a company in a way that produces a return. And frequently uh, entrepreneurs don't understand this, but it's important to understand before you take venture capital. I think really there's there's three areas uh, somewhat tied together. The first area is a reluctance to um, to talk to advisors, independent people who will give you who have some subject matter expertise in in the products or the markets you're looking at, and will give you some very objective advice. Uh, secondly, is a, a reluctance of, to uh, surround yourself with very smart people, complementary skills people. Uh, and recognize, especially in the case of some academicians who are spinning out uh, new technology. Uh, you know, some academicians may be a doctor in a given field, but uh, don't recognize that that doesn't translate necessarily to management and financial and marketing skills, and they have to hire to those skills. Um, and I think tied to that is the willingness to share equity with um, your, your key uh, employees, and um, key advisors. And I think lastly, there's a paranoia about competition. What I mean by that is some people think there's no competition, and, and there's always competition, or that their, their product is so secret, uh, they don't even want to discuss or talk about their product out of fear of uh, someone stealing it. And that just doesn't, I don't think that happens in our business. The kinds of mistakes that entrepreneurs make to preclude them from gaining financing are a couple. Number one, um, it's really all about a network. Uh, an awful lot of entrepreneurs don't network very well. Uh, they don't take the time to go out and go beyond the traditional uh, venture capital, angel investor community to really find out uh, and seek out those individuals who truly uh, would invest in their company at probably more agreeable terms than the traditional uh, folks that you would you'd expect on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, another thing that, uh, that entrepreneurs generally don't do is they don't understand the dynamics of their business as well as you would expect. In other words, an awful lot of entrepreneurs really love the technology and feel that if they build it, someone's going to buy it. Um, one of the questions that, and a series of questions that any investor will ask an entrepreneur is, well, if something goes wrong, what are you going to do if? If this doesn't go right, how are you going to react to that? If the market doesn't grow at such and such a rate, what are you going to do? Uh, and quite frankly, what we see are an awful lot of entrepreneurs who have those questions brought before them. All they've thought about is the good stuff that, that could occur and don't think about, well, if this happens or that happens or the dynamic change or the market crashes or the economy sh shifts, how am I going to grow my business? And quite frankly, how am I going to provide a return on investment to my, uh, to my investors? Your success as an entrepreneur is predicated on getting a certain amount of money for a certain job and a certain project. And it really doesn't matter where the money comes from, first and foremost. If you have a plethora of opportunities vis-a-vis -vis where you can get the money, then yes, you'd probably want to get smart money, money that can help you in the longer term, but smart money that doesn't show up at closing isn't terribly useful. I don't think every entrepreneur should be going to a venture capitalist. There are a lot of other sources of funding. There's Bootstrap, there are angel investors, there are networks of private investors. 
Venture capital is really for those entrepreneurs who are attacking very large markets, would need to grow very quickly, for whom first mover advantage is absolutely critical, and for entrepreneurs who are willing, frankly, to give up a large percentage of their equity to someone who's managing money on behalf of even larger institutions. There's a couple different ways to fund a company, particularly in today's environment. You know, the most popular and easiest, frankly, is to bootstrap a company. Uh, if you've got people who are willing to give you money to get a service rendered or a product developed, there's a pretty good indication that more people will pay you over time. Once you've used up that as an alternative, uh, a subsequent way is venture capital or angel capital. First of all, both angels and venture capitalists love to see a company that's already got a revenue stream from bootstrapping. There are multiple ways to fund a company. Um, there are traditional ways through uh, seed capital, venture capital, angel investors, but there are a multitude of um, alternative financing available in the marketplace. One that we bring to the marketplace is leveraging what's called a 504B, which allows a company to go to the public markets, the, um, the stock exchange, sell stock into the marketplace, thereby um, taking advantage or deriving revenues into the company uh, from the, the open markets. Well, there are about s at least a half a dozen ways to, to get uh, investment funds into a startup company. Um, as simply as um, going to your friends and family and asking, um, asking for some money, $10,000, $50,000 or more. Um, and there are pros and cons certainly to that if you want your family uh, to be very, very um, uh, much a part of your company. And every time you have a family gathering, if you want them asking questions about your business that day, um, that's what you'll get with family and friends funding. Um, if you go to uh, angel investors or venture capitalists, then there are several things that you must do. You must put together an executive summary. You must put together a, uh, a business plan. And you must put together a dynamite uh, presentation pitch uh, for them. You also could get funding from um, or loans from from banks. Uh, you can get an SBA loan or you can go to the government for an SBIR um, um, grant or um, the government will have some grants for specific technologies that might be of interest to the nation. Well, the 504 um, really uh, provides uh, multiple advantages um, to a small entre entrepreneurial company. Um, to do a traditional IPO would require engaging in a Wall Street firm, a blue chip Wall Street firm, investment banking firm, which would cost upwards of hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, uh, and the scrutiny is, is uh, incredible. And it would also require numerous hours of the management team. And quite frankly, the requirements from a financial perspective on an ongoing basis really preclude an awful lot of small companies from even contemplating going to the public markets. The 504 offers um, small companies the opportunity to go to the public markets through what's called a mini IPO and again gain access to the public markets. We like to refer it at, to it as crawl, walk, run. As a company, if a company were to do a traditional IPO, it would quite frankly require a management team that has experience in dealing with markets on the big board. Uh, the, the reporting requirements are very, very heavy. The expenses are quite onerous into the hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, a year. The 504 opportunity provides a company with a prospect of going to the public markets, but at far lesser cost, far lesser, uh, a, a smaller degree of of, um, of distraction to the management team, but ultimately provides them with uh, this, the ac similar access to the public markets over a, over a period of time. The 504 offering has been out for several years. The issue is most people really don't know about most alternative financing that's available in the marketplace today. So it is a fairly unique offering. Uh, it's an opportunity we found with angels sitting on the sideline, the angels investors sitting on the sideline, and with venture capitalists truly not acting as venture capitalists anymore, they're, they're more mezzanine bankers, we found a tremendous need in the marketplace for entrepreneurs, uh, young companies that have revenue streams uh, to seek financing to help grow their companies. Uh, and so the 504, again, provides this unique vehicle whereby these companies have access to 
the public markets to in a, in, to help grow their companies um, versus trying to go out to venture capitalists. One of the things to keep in mind between a 504 and going to the traditional VC route is, is VCs require a tremendous amount of equity in your company just to consider uh, doing business with you. In other words, most VCs will require between 60 and 80 percent of your company in equity and ownership in your company for access to their capital. With a 504, the dilution to the founders is minimized uh, to a small degree um, and which leaves the, the founders and original shareholders uh, obviously with less d dilution and more opportunity for appreciation in their, uh, their, the value of their stock and their holdings within the company. The process to, uh, towards a 504, first of all, you have to have a business plan that's, that's been uh, uh, documented that will support the business because the business plan, um, in turn, is, um, is uh, placed within what's called a private placement memorandum. That private placement memorandum is then sold to a group of investors who are willing to go and buy into the company early on before it's gone public. Um, at that point in time, there is a uh, requirement to go through the NESD, which is a, a regulatory agency, to ensure that the company's financials, their business plan, um, follow muster so that the company can go public. Once the uh, NASD has been engaged, then the company is then listed on what's called the pink sheets or the, um, the bulletin boards. Uh, at that point in time, the company can sell stock in the marketplace. Uh, quite frankly, that's the beginning of the process and then uh, through uh, additional uh, efforts and filling out additional forms with the SEC, the company is then moves on to the OTCBB, which is really a much larger market. It is a, a market that m uh, thousands uh, of investors participate in, and thus allowing the company now to have access to a huge investor base. And quite frankly, that's where you see the volume and share price uh, both go up if, as the company execute. After the OTCBB, the company now has the option and opportunity to grow either to the American Exchange, the Amex, or to NASDAQ, um, depending on their asset base and other requirements. Well, to, uh, to engage in a 504 is fairly unique. Uh, the 504 itself is only offered in two states in the United States to date, Colorado and Texas. Um, those are the two states that support a 504 offering. The way to engage, there are multiple companies if you go on the, on the internet, type in 504B or Regulation D504, you'll find a multitude of companies that provide either software or uh, a set of services. Um, we provide a full set of software and services where literally we take a company and handhold it through the entire 504 process, helping them draft their business plan, helping them with all the forms and requirements and, and, and communication with the NASD, the regulatory agency that um, that manages the pink sheets or the OTC, um, and also take, help manage them towards the OTCBB through submitting all the forms to the SEC as they move up to the bulletin board. So the best way would be just to go on the web, look for different companies that provide a full set of services um, to leverage this 504 process. No matter how smart you are, no matter how good looking you are, no matter how great your idea is, there is still an excess of demand with regards to the supply of capital. So it's hard to get. So my strongest possible advice is don't give up. You're never gonna know what it's like. You can watch all the videos, you can take, read all the books, take all the courses, live vicariously in many, many ways, but until you do it, until you find a, a management team you're comfortable with and a group of people you like and an idea you really feel passionate about, you're not gonna know the feeling of success. So my encouragement is go out and make something happen. I really hope any of you who are looking for funding um, can do it right, can do it quickly, and can do it very successfully. Lots of luck to you. Well, good luck to you. Have a great time. Uh, again, this is probably the most exciting opportunity you'll have in your career. And this is an opportunity to develop a network of investors and individuals that will last a lifetime. <laughs>